What's up guys? So in this video, we'll be talking about tributary loadings and how to determine how the loads on our surface structures, namely your, your walls, your slabs, and your roofs, are transmitted to your structural elements that are used to support them. Okay, so let's begin. Right, so first let's define what is a tributary loading. So a tributary loading is the loading that a specific structural element supports. Uh, your tributary loadings are defined by your tributary areas. Your tributary areas are the loaded areas that directly contributes to that member. These areas are usually um, or usually have boundaries that are located halfway to the next beam or the next column. Now, there are generally two ways in which we could approach this and can be done. The choice depends on the geometry of the structural system, the material from which it is made, and the method of its construction. So the first approach is your one-way system or your one-way slab systems, and the second one is your two-way system or your two-way slab systems. Okay, so let's discuss one-way systems first. Now on a one-way system, the load is being delivered by a one-way action. As an example in this one, um, let's see a floor framing system. So we have our slabs here, or our slab here, and it is being supported by your floor beams or your beams. So we have three beams here. We have beam EF, beam CD, and beam AB. And then these beams are supported by your two girders. So we have girder AE, and girder BF. And these girders are supported by our columns. Column E, column F, column B, and then we have column A right here. Okay? So it's, it is important to know in determining your tributary loadings how your loadings are being transmitted. So in our case, as by the definition, for one-way system, the load is being delivered by a one-way action. So you can see from the figure that the slab is only being supported in one direction by these beams, right? So it is safe to assume that this is a one-way system. Now we're going to determine the loadings that are being supported by our beams and our girders. So let's start with our beam CD. Okay, so first step, we need to determine the tributary area of our beam CD. As stated earlier, the tributary area has uh, boundaries that are located halfway to the next beam or the next column. In our, in our case, it would be the next beam. So for the upper boundary, halfway uh, to beam AB, it would be 2.5 feet. And then for the lower boundary, halfway to beam EF, Again, it would be 2.5 feet. So this would be the boundary of our tributary area. So uh, whatever the loading that will be placed in this area will be supported by our beam CD. Alright, so now that we know the tributary area, our next step would be to draw the analytical model of our beam. So to do that, we're just going to draw it a line diagram. And we're going to assume that our beam is just a simply supported beam. It means that we have a hinge and a roller for the supports. Now that we have the line diagram, the next thing that we need to figure out is what would be the loading. So to solve for the loading, we need to figure out how much load is a small portion of our beam, specifically one feet of our beam, is going to be supporting. So we're just going to cut a small section from our tributary area and solve for the loading. So for the dimensions, this is 1 feet and this is 5 feet. Now to solve for the area being carried by that small section, we're just going to multiply 100 pounds per feet squared times 1 feet times 5 feet and that will be equal to 500 pounds. It means that for every 1 feet of our beam, 
it is carrying 500 pounds. Now, we could um, write that or draw that or illustrate that as a uniform distributed load like this one. And it is, uh, we can now say that our beam is now carrying 500 pounds for every feet. Okay? Next, uh, let's figure out what would be the loading for our beam AB. Now, the tributary area for our beam AB would be this one. So again, we're just going to determine what is the loading that is being carried by a small por portion, by one feet of that beam. So again, we're just going to get a small cross-sectional area of that. So this would be your one feet and this would be 2.5 feet. And then we're just going to compute for the load. So we have 1,000 pounds per feet squared times one feet times 2.5 feet. And that would be equal to 250 pounds. So for every one feet of your beam, it is carrying 250 pounds. So we could um, illustrate this as a uniform load that is that has an intensity of 250 pounds per feet. And obviously, since our system is symmetrical and beam EF is or have the same tributary area as your beam AB, obviously, it is carrying the same uniform load, 250 pounds per feet, right? So the next step is actually solving for the reactions on our beams. So why do we need to solve for the reactions of our beams? Because these reactions will be the one that will be carried by the girders. Yeah. All right. So to solve for the reactions on our beam, we're just going to apply our statics or specifically the equations of equilibrium. Now to solve for the reactions, uh, we're going to apply summation of moment and summation of forces. Now let's say we want to solve for the reaction at C. We're just going to apply summation of moment at D. And then once that we have the reaction at C, we can just um, do a summation of vertical forces and we'd get the reaction at D. Okay? Um, we can do the same thing for beam AB that has a load of 250 pounds per feet. So once that we know the loadings, or rather the reactions of our beams, we can now transfer it to our girders. So for example, for beam CD, we have reactions 2,500, 2,500. And then for beams AB, we're going to have a reaction of 1,250, 1,250. And it would be the same for beam EF, 1,250, 1,250. And those loads are going to be carried by our girders. As you can see in the idealized structure of our girder. And once now we have the loadings of our girders, um, we could further this along and solve the reactions. And once now we have our reactions, those reactions would be further carried by our columns. All right. So as a side note, some of our slabs or some of our surface structures uh, may be supported in two directions. It means that, um, unlike this case, that the support of our slab is only in along one direction. What if um, we also have a support along this direction? So we might have... Um, we need to determine if that slab or that floor system or that um, structural system is a one-way system or a two-way system. Now, to do that, we're going to consider our ACI code. So, from the ACI code, it states that when L2, which is our long span, is greater than our L1, which is our short span, and when you divide... L2 by L1 and it is um, greater than 2, it means that it is a one-way system. Okay? Next, 
let's consider our two-way slabs. So for the two-way slabs, um, this, uh, this occurs when the loads are delivered to the beams and girders in two directions. As an example, here we have a floor system again. So the difference um, from this example to this example is that here, the support is only in one direction. Here, it is coming from two directions. Right? So the first step here is that we need to determine if this is a two-way system. Now to do that, um, we need to again consider our ACI code. So if we divide the longer span by the shorter span and it is less than or equal to 2, then we can consider that um, structural system as a two-way system. So in our case, our L2 is just equal to our L1, which is 10 feet. So when we divide this, we know that our 2 would be greater than 1. So we could consider this as a two-way system. Alright, so when considering two-way systems, um, we need to consider the loads that will be carried by all the structural members. So for example, we have four beams here that would share the load of our slab. Now to determine the tributary area, in our case, what you're going to do is you're just going to draw a 45 degree line from your endpoints. So just draw a 45 degree line here, this one 45 degree line here, and then another 45 degree line here. So basically, these triangles, these triangular areas, so whatever you place in those, whatever loading is placed in those would be carried by this beam. Likewise, whatever loading we place in this tributary area would be carried by beam AB. Here, our beam BD would carry whatever load we place in this triangular area. Alright? So it also means that our loading will not be um, uniform unlike before since our, the in intensities would differ since along the middle, it has much greater area compared to this area, right? So if you would notice, um, let's consider beam AB first. So let's draw the analytical um, model for beam AB. So we're going to use a line diagram right here. And we're going to assume that the supports are fixed. Okay. So now that we have the line diagram, what we need to do is we need to determine the, um, the loading that will be carried by that beam. So to solve that for that, we just need to determine what would be the peak loading at the middle of our beam. Since that is where your peak load, the highest intensity of your load occurs. Okay? So to compute for that, we just consider a small, very, very strip, a very, very small strip of area here. And then multiply our uniform loading on our slab. So that's 1,000 pounds per square feet multiplied by 5 feet and that would be equal to 500 pounds per feet and that would be the load that the pick load that our beam would carry and obviously along the ends it will carry zero load so here zero na dito so it would carry a varying load just like illustrated here in our figure. Alright, so we have here another example of how geometries can cause two-way action. So in our case, our beam AB is now larger than your beam BD as opposed to earlier where they have the same length. Okay, so first let's determine if this is really a 
two-way um, two way system. So first off, let's divide our L2, which is the longer span, 15 feet, by our L1, which is 10 feet. So this is equal to 1.5 feet. So obviously, this is um, less than 2. So we could consider this as a two-way system. All right? So let's determine the loading or the load takedown of our beams. So we have four beams here, beam A, B, beam C, D, and beam A, C, and B, D. So obviously, since um, as you can see from the illustration, um, these beams have the same tributary area, our beam A, C, and beam B, D, and beam A, B have the same tributary area as beam C, D. So... Our idealized beams here, although this is beam AB only, this would have our beam CD would have the same loading, and our beam BD would have the same loading as this one. Okay, first step, let's determine the uh, tributary areas. So as stated earlier, when considering two-way systems, um, to determine the boundaries of your uh, tributary areas, you're going to construct a diagonal line as shown in the figure. So we have 45 degree lines here. And then from the intersection, you're just going to draw a straight line. Alright, so now that we know the tributary area for our first beam, beam AB, the next step is to determine the peak loadings. So the peak loading would occur in this segment. Right? So we just need to determine what would be the peak loading at one of these um, locations. And to do that, again, we're just going to multiply the, the uniform load, which was 100 pounds per square feet by 5 feet. And that is 500 pounds per feet. And then likewise, for beam AC and beam... BD. So we're just going to solve for the peak loading that is occurring at the middle of our beam. So in this location. So again, you're just going to multiply this by our uniform load pound per square feet times 5 feet. And again, this is just 500 pounds per feet. Okay, so that's the loading of our beams. Okay, so that's it for your tributary areas and tributary loadings. I'll see you guys on the next video. Thank you for watching.